Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to Prague Chattery 777. Talking about Genesis and we've made it to the controversial years. Very controversial years. Oh, I just want to move this. Whew, there we go. I think that's better. I hope it's better. Controversial years by Genesis. We're in 1981. They've just released Abacab. This is actually a very good album. And this, this is where a lot of the... Uh, the the prog hardcore folks will say, nope, it was at this point that the band was worthless and poo, 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 poo. I used to be one of those people. I, you know, there, there was a time where I didn't think there was anything good after uh, Wind and Weathering. But, you know, you, you, you listen to it more and you start to mature and you start to, you know, rethink your opinions on things. And the fact of the matter is, I think this is, Abacab is probably the most ambitious album they ever did since The Lamb. Yeah, I said that. I think this is the most ambitious album since The Lamb. Or possibly Chick of the Tail, because it was pretty ambitious to go out without Peter Gabriel. You know, that that's an ambitious thing inherently. But um, it's also a very progressive album, because this is, the, this is the moment where they really decided to let go of the past. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned with Chick of the Tail and Wind and Wuthering, Wind and Wuthering that they were kind of looking back to what they'd done before as a reference to, you know, how how they could, you know, maintain their fan base and and carry on. Whereas now they're they're looking strictly to the future. They're make they're they're making totally fresh music again, which I think is great and it revitalized the band and uh you know, it helped lead to to greater success. The other thing that's obviously worth noting uh is between Duke and this Face Value was released, and overnight Phil Collins just randomly became like the biggest freaking music person on the face of the planet. Overnight, the most random thing ever, you know, just kind of basically just some fun. He was messing around writing some songs about his divorce. Um, they happen to be very good songs. I think Face Value is a very good album. I'm not a big fan of some of his other solo stuff, but Face Value is a great album. Um, and yeah, the, like I said, overnight he, he achieved more success than Genesis ever did up until that point, and more success than any of the, you know, solo careers of the other Genesis band members. And, man, how strange is that? I mean, the, the other guys have been writing songs since they were in, you know, school, and then, you know, Collins had been, you know, Mr. Music Guy, you know, the, the musician -y guy into fusion and, uh, you know, instrumental stuff, like a top-notch, world-class drummer who just decided to kind of write some songs after he got sad from a traumatic event, and boom, he just became a superstar. And I think that influenced the, the really great sales of this, too. And, of course, everyone thought that everyone thought that Phil Collins and Genesis was Phil Collins' band, and that wasn't the case at all. Phil was still just the drummer who happened to be the singer. So the, the, way, the way things went at, at that point in, in Genesis history is very interesting. There's a lot of people probably never even knew that Genesis were a you know crazy prog band that wrote things like The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Uh, and yet here, you know, here, oh, here's Genesis, that guy, that, that Phil Collins guy that did the drum fill in, in the air tonight. This is his band. No, it's not. It's Genesis. If anything, Tony Banks is probably the heart and soul of Genesis. But they never really had a leader. That's, that's the thing I'm trying to say. Genesis was always Genesis. So... Uh, let's let's take a look at the songs then, shall we? Kind of a cool album cover. It's not the best album cover. I always I always cheat. I'll say one thing and then talk about another. We gotta talk about the cover. It's not the best album cover in the world, but it represents what the band were trying to do. Um, that kind of the kind of minimalist uh, postmodern kind of a thing. Um, let me get inner sleeve. It's got a picture of the band sitting in the farm. I think this is the first album they recorded at the farm, which became their famous studio. Troubles with this sleeve again. Darn it, darn it, darn it, inner sleeve. So, yeah. First song of the album is the title track, Abacab. Um, song that I never used to like that much, but then I realized is actually a really, really good song. A lot better live, because they extended the end of it. The first thing you notice when the song comes on is the uh, enhanced production. They got Hugh Padgham involved who was responsible for the gated drum sound, which was first heard on Peter Gabriel's third record, the Melty Face record. <clears throat> I'll be talking about those one day. Um, 
and yeah, you get the big the big gated drum sound and just just the sound in general. I mean, Padgham was a pretty innovative producer in his day, and uh, I think that that's a really strong factor of the album is just how good it sounds. Um, right away, there is a difference though. Uh, Collins, I mean, his drumming is still fantastic as always, but it is a little simplified. Um, you know, the the song doesn't really waver too far or go into any dramatic changes or go into any um, harmonic craziness or anything like that. It's pretty streamlined. But it is a long song. It's a seven-minute song. Um, it's and I find it engaging the whole way through. It's got a couple of little instrumental sections that kind of pop in and out. Um, the title is meaningless. It's about the structure of the song they put together. Like, okay, well, I'll have part A, then part B, then part A, then we'll go to part C, then back to part A, and then B, Abacab. Although that's not the structure of the song. At one point it was. Uh, and the real highlight of the song for me is at the end when the tempo gets cut in half and they slow it down a little bit and we get the, um, the Tony Banks keyboard uh, extravaganza. And there's a little bit of lead playing from Mike Rutherford, which is really cool. Um, the live version of this song, like I said, on uh, Three Sides Live is far superior, and you, you, you really you really see how good a song this is. It's still, it, it's still proggy. I mean, I, I don't really consider it to have a pop song, but it is more streamlined than what they've been doing before. Track two on side one is No Reply At All. There's a lot of controversy around this one because they got, I think it was the Earth, Wind, and Fire horn section that uh, they enlisted to, you know, play along on this, and obviously that's very not Genesis. I mean, you can't get more not English than having, you know, some soul horns playing on your record, but I think it's great, uh, and I think Colin's drum performance on, on No Reply at All is fantastic. It, it's, you know, that classic, frantic, a lot of ghost notes, um fusion-y kind of drum pattern. It's just, it's just locked into a great groove, and the way the horns bounce off of Colin's shots, I mean, it's it's great. It's a very detailed arrangement. Um, and it is kind of classic Genesis, too. I mean, just like the piano. That, that reminds me of early Genesis. I, I think just with the, you know, the funky horns. But again, it's adventurous, that's progressive, you know, that's ambitious for them to, to go and do something like that. And, you know, if you're into prog music because you like complex arrangements and whatnot, no reply at all. Of course, there's a lot of complex stuff there. And even the, the middle section kind of reminds me a little bit of the earlier Genesis, too. So, I mean, those threads are still there, but they're being adventurous now. They're looking for new, new things to do. Let me get Me and Sarah Jane. This is the first song on the album that's got an individual songwriting credit. This is the Banks song. And uh, I think it's one of my favorite Tony Banks songs, actually. It, it's quite compact. I think, I think it's less than five minutes, I think. Um, but it, it, it does have the multi-section kind of thing going on. And there's, there's a few weird arrangements. Um, there's a really romantic kind of section where all the keyboards are all flourishing. That's kind of the peak of the song in the middle. Um, great little syncopated bits. The fantastic drumming. One of the highlights on the album, actually. I think Me and Sarah Jane is could could be one of the best songs on the album, yeah. Um, you know, it's classic condensed prog music. There's very little repetition in the song, actually. A lot of harmonic deviations and a lot of harmonic changes in that. Really good. Uh, then we get to Keep It Dark. Now, this is, this is one of those ambitious experimental songs. I think it's just a drum loop they got with this awkward riff. Uh, I, I love the guitar riff. <laughs> I, I, it's, it, it's weird and awkward, and I mean, the, the way that it all kind of fits together like a jigsaw really appeals to me. Um, it's got, it's got kind of got a classic Genesis lyric. It's talking about a guy that gets abducted by aliens and sees this wonderful world full of joy and peace and, and loveliness everywhere, and then he comes back down to earth and he's tormented by the fact that he can't tell anyone about it because no one's going to believe him. It's kind of watcher of the skies-ish kind of lyrical stuff. And then the the kind of chorus of it that, oh, keep it dark. He's, they got this kind of percussive drum sound in the background. That became a bit of a sound in the 80s. They did it for, for Genesis, an 80s Genesis sound, having that tribal percussion thing going on. 
Yeah, it's really good. The first side to this album is really strong. Um, and so is the second side, as we see. So we flip the record over. We get Dodo. Again, contender for the best song on the album. Dodo and Lurker. It's a, that, that's one song. And there's, there was also, like, um, Nanamo and Submarine. It's Nanamana or something like that. There was another, like, bit of kind of instrumental jamming that was originally going to be attached to it. It would have been, like, a ten-minute song. But instead, it's about seven minutes, and it's a it's a classic piece of Genesis. Uh, Collins in the the middle section between the two, he does kind of a Peter Gabriel esque thing. He does the, he does the weird um, the weird voice changes, like the character narration kind of stuff. But he kind of owns this one. I mean, he he, uh, he he's not doing it like Peter Gabriel, but he's he's doing it like it's a Genesis thing, and he, he's. You know, he, he like I said at this point, Collins had really found his own as a song, as a singer, and. You know, it's great how he puts his own slant on those theatrical characters that were, you know, always a Genesis trademark. Uh, I, I just like the song. It is, it's, it's, I, I call that classic Genesis. It's the long song of the album. They always had, there was more short songs, but they always had at least one or two long songs in the 80s. And then after Dodo and Lurker, we get Who Done It? It might be the stupidest song Genesis ever did. There's one other that we'll talk about later that might be stupider. But this is pretty stupid. The was it you or was it me, was it me, did... It's so silly. And, I mean, the, the, the drum beat is just deliberately silly garbage, and the keyboard sounds, and... <laughs> Tony Banks called it the punk song. It's not really a punk song. It's just Genesis being goofballs. And, you know, while I don't think it's absolutely necessary on the album, it gives it the quirky factor that I think uh, Duke miss Duke is missing the quirkiness a little bit. Who Done It brings the quirkiness of, uh, you know, some of the Gabriel stuff, I guess. Some of, like, the I Know What I Like in Your Wardrobe. It's a bit lowbrow and a bit silly, but... Honestly, I like Who Done It more than I like uh, Your Own Special Way, so that's saying something. I get more entertainment value listening to Who Done It than I do listening to Your Own Special Way. So that's that's saying something. It may be the stupidest song <laughs> that they ever did, but doesn't necessarily mean it's a horrible song. It's just stupid. Uh, then, massive contrast. After the silliness of that, we get Man on the Corner, which is Phil Collins' contribution. I think this is one of the strongest songs... Uh, Collins contributed to Genesis. I really like Man on the Corner. Uh, I think it's about homelessness. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's very ballady, but, I mean, it, it's it's not cheesy. It's talking about, like, a social issue. And, um, you know, there, there's a sincerity about it that I really like. It's got this really awkward drum beat, or, uh, drum machine pattern at the start. Um, so it's kind of hard for the other for the other guys to to know when to start uh, to, to when they get the actual melody melody going. But yeah, Man on the Corner is really good. Great drumming on it too. Then we move on to Like It or Not. Um, meh. It's just it's just a song. <laughs> uh, arguably the weaker one on the album. But there you go. It's near the end. Uh, then we get another record, which, uh, yeah, I like it, you know, it's, it's not the greatest thing on, it's not the greatest thing on the album, it's kind of a, the last two songs are a bit meh, but another record is okay, you know, it's not too long, it doesn't overstay its welcome, it's got a really, really cool Collins pattern with the triplets, that part's really cool, um, and the, the intro is, it kind of reminds you of the early Genesis stuff. It's always a shame, though, because you, you think, you know, the, the classic Genesis albums before this always had the big instrumental wind up to galactic levels. And this is, you just kind of put another record on. A lot of people that could, there's a lot of anti 80s Genesis people that would probably use that, you know, put any record other than this on. But, you know what? This is a really strong album. It's. Depending on my mood, it's it's one of my favorite ones. If I'm if I'm in an '80s Genesis mood, then it's it might be my favorite of the '80s stuff, because it's fresh, it's ambitious, it's progressive. You know, they're looking for a new direction. Um, 
I mean, really, it's a, it's a shot of the band firing on all cylinders, you know. It's not at all a bad album. And you know, for Dodo and Lurker, me and Sarah Jane and Abacab, that's worth the that's worth the price of admission right there. Of admission. So yeah, there you go. 1981, Genesis, Abacab, the first of the pop albums. Join me next time, where I will be talking about Genesis by Genesis. We'll see you then.